Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on a new book entitled The Ever-Changing Past, Why All History is Revisionist History by Jim Banna, the co-founder of the National History Center, published this year by Yale University Press. Professor Banner, congratulations and welcome. We're also very fortunate to have with us Northwestern University's Sarah Mazza, who will provide initial comments and begin this afternoon's discussion that we hope will involve many of you in the audience as well. Professor Mazza, a warm welcome to the Washington History Seminar. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege to co-chair this seminar series with Eric Arneson of George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. For more than a decade now, the seminar series has tried to provide a nonpartisan forum in the nation's capital to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications. Prior to the pandemic, we met on a weekly basis at the Wilson Center, but we've been very pleased to come to you via Zoom and Facebook for almost a year, and we're delighted that many more people have been able to participate in these sessions. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who helped produce this event, uh, Rachel Wheatley for the National History Center, um, supported today by Emma Billings, as well as Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both, to all three of them. We want to acknowledge our supporters and we also thank our two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History in the Public Interest and George Washington University's History Department. We welcome your support. Details about how to support the seminar will be available in the chat right now or simply go to our institutional websites. Let me invite you to join us next week for a discussion of Alex Wellerstein's new book, Restricted Data, the History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States. That's next Monday, May 10 at 4 p.m. Finally, today's featured publication, The Ever-Changing Past, will be available uh, for a discount. Information will be uh, posted in the chat momentarily. A quick explanation uh, on the, the technical side of today's um, session. The session, as always, will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations' websites. For the Q&A part of the seminar, Eric will remind you in a moment, but just to lay it all out, you have several options. Um, we prefer you use the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality uh, to ask a question. Once you press the button, you will be entered into a queue. And once we get to discussion, the moderator calls on you and you will receive a prompt that will ask you to unmute your screen. Please press yes, and then we should be able to hear you. You can also use the Q and A function at the top, at least in my case, it's the top of the Zoom screen to post your question. And you can also email us um, uh, as some of you have done prior to the question to pose your questions. With that, let me turn over the Zoom room to my co-chair, Professor Eric Arneson. Eric, over to you. Thank you so much, Christian. It is my genuine pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker, our author this afternoon, James M. Banner Jr., who is currently a visiting scholar in history at the George Washington University. Jim is no stranger to the Washington History Seminar. He's a co-founder of the National History Center, one of its sponsors, uh, and is a regular and engaged participant in this seminar back when we met in person and over the past year in the virtual realm. Uh, today, you won't be able to ask questions, Jim. We get to ask them of you. Um, he's a founder of the American Association for the Advancement of 
the humanities. He's been a recipient of Guggenheim and Charles Warren sent their fellowships and among his many publications are to the Hartford Convention, The Federalists and the Origins of Party Politics in Massachusetts, 1789 to 1815, published in 1969 by Knopf and Being an Historian, An Introduction to the Professional World of History, Cambridge University Press, 2012. In 2019, he published a rather timely volume, uh, edited volume, Presidential Misconduct from George Washington to Today, put out by New Press. And this afternoon, he will be speaking on his just published Yale University Press book, The Ever-Changing Past, While All History is Revisionist History. With that, Jim, the Zoom room is all yours. Eric, uh, thank you so much, um, Christian, too. Rachel Reedley, I think absent today, Emma Billings, and Peter, Peter Bierstecker, and particularly Sarah Massa, who I've known since when, Sarah, the uh, late 60s or the early 70s at Princeton. Um, I want to show everyone a copy of Sarah's wonderful book, um, Thinking About History, um, and I recommend that everybody become acquainted with it, read it, own it, and take in its wisdom. Um, I want to start this evening, um, this afternoon, uh, with a brief story about the origins of this book. I suppose one has to say that it came up, that, that, that its origins could only have happened in Washington. Uh, my late colleague, uh, some of you no doubt knew him, um, Roger Brown, a historian like myself of the early American Republic, and I found ourselves sitting in the Supreme Court chambers of Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, Roger and I were leading about 55 uh, middle and high school teachers through what had become known as Constitution Boot Camp, a month long program on the origins of American constitutional government. And the justice had agreed to speak with us uh, and sort of to be briefed. He wanted to be briefed before he spoke with the students. So Roger and I were sitting in his in his chambers and having a very lively conversation. He's a very lively, very well-informed, um, very smiley man at ease with himself. And he realized he had two historians there. And he said, hey guys, um, you might like to know that I'm spending the summer uh, reading um, books about the history of slavery in the South. What could we say? But terrific, Mr. Justice, tell us what you're reading. So he named John Hope Franklin and Kenneth Stamp and John Bat Blassingame but not, he said, the revisionists. And um, he may have had in mind Robert Fogel and Stanley Engerman's time on the cross. We didn't go down that road, but instead, Roger and I had the wit to say, um, uh, do you know anything about these authors, particularly John Hope Franklin? And he didn't know much about them. So we led him through the history, particularly of Franklin from slavery to freedom from 1947 to the time we were speaking with of the justice and, 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 and Franklin's life. And so we said to sort of wind up the conversation. So Mr. Justice, um, the books that you're reading for the summer, we, you should know and keep in mind um, are works of revisionist history. And indeed some of the most important works of revisionist history uh, of the late 20th century. Well, with that uneasy with the conversation Justice Thomas took the conversation in another direction. Um, now, Roger and I could have attributed that switch because I think that had you been present, you would have said, this conversation is going really well. Um, he's likely to say, what do you mean, Professor Banner? What do you mean, Roger Brown? He didn't do that. Now, of course, we could attribute that to Thomas's originalism. But I think more was at stake than that. Um, Justice Thomas, like so many people, had a view of historical thought as being static and forever, stable, certain, without context, separate from its creator's intentions and dispositions. And that experience gnawed at me for many years, and that's what led me to try to explain what we mean when we use the term revisionist history. Um, my original thought was far from thinking through um, a subject that eventually in our recent years would come to fill the headlines. But then of course, the subject became more than academic. It became um, urgent and relevant. And I, of course, have written this book 
I'm looking over my shoulder at the public debates about true and fake news, true and fake history and facts and everything else. But was there anything new to say about the subject? After all, don't all practicing historians orient themselves in the literature of their subjects before they dig into those subjects? Don't we all know what revisionist history means? Well, after thinking about the subject for a few years and writing a book about it, um, I don't think that we do. So I have taken a stab at thinking through the subject and no doubt it is not a stab that you would have taken, any of you would have taken. Um, and one of the reasons is because there's not much literature on revisionist history as a general phenomenon. All of us who write and practice history know the literature of our particular special subjects. So we take it for granted that we know the literature so we know that what we are doing fits into that literature and what contribution it may make and what we're trying to make and so on. So we're all acquainted with revisionist history, but we haven't thought about the subject as a whole. And in fact, my book is only the second book that I know of in, in the English language on the subject. And the first one was written, it was published in 1929, was written by Lucy Maynard Salmon, a very good book for its time, but one that no longer suits our own day. So what I say this afternoon is the result of a tour through uncharted territory. There's not a big literature about revisionist history. Oh, surely there are books about the histories of the Civil War, Tom Presley's books, for example. Um, there are certainly books, wonderful books about the history of historical thought. And needless to say, what I've taken up has much to do with historical thought, but from a particular slant, not to, I'm not trying to make sense of how historical thought has changed because that has been taken up by people who are uh, greatly my master and my better in that subject. So I've just been cutting into it in a, a new way. And so what I'm going to say from now on is, is me speaking. It's not an argument with an existing literature. I've tried to go at the subject as best I can. No doubt all of you would do it differently. You're welcome to do so. I think we need much more discussion of the subject than we have ever had. So um, let me dig in um, and, and present a kind of tour d'horizon of the subject. Um, we're dealing with a general phenomenon that has existed, I think, I have to argue, and, and, and is a valid statement, has existed from the days of Herodotus and Thucydides. Um, revisionist history is an integral com component of historical thought. It's a, in the second place, it's a component of historical thought that has a history of its own that's distinct from the history of historical thought. But it's a component of historical thought that has been little thought about. Now, what is revisionist history, you will ask me. Um, defining it is really quite difficult. Um, I take a broad view of it, one that makes every work of history at least prospectively and potentially revisionist. Now, revisionist history is any work, it seems to me, that adds to our knowledge of the past or that adds a fresh interpretation of some aspect of it. And that is, it's any challenge to existing interpretations of any aspect of the past brought about by new evidence, new arguments, new perspectives, or new methods. So I, am, I offer a capacious uh, definition of revisionist history uh, to you. Too promiscuous? Some people think so. I don't think so. But much of this, much of my definition has to do with scale, which I'll get to in a few minutes. So it'll, I think it'll help clarify um, the definition, the broad definition, uh, definition that I'm offering to you. Um, in employing such a broad definition of revisionist history, I'm trying to bring consideration of the larger phenomenon into the open. 
because uh, as you've already heard me say, it, it really deserves more attention than it has received. Um, history, after all, um, I, I suspect some, but not all of you will agree with me. Sarah, I believe, will certainly agree with me, is a comparatively under-theorized discipline. Now, I'm not offering a hard case that history should find itself cheek by jowl with literary scholars or uh, historians of art, um, but we've been woefully lax in exposing ourselves to the realities, the logical, the philosophical, and yes, the historical uh, realities of historical inquiry. Um, I'd love to go down that road, but that's a subject for some other time, some other place, and really for people who know more about um, the logic of historical inquiry and so on than I do. But I think of it as um, a, a subject um, like the sociology of the humanities that desperately needs attention. I mean, I ask myself quite frequently, where is the Robert Merton? Where is the Imre Lakatos for the humanities? Why don't we have sociology of the humanities and perhaps the related social sciences as we do of the sciences? It's really, to me, a very, very um, noticeable uh, lack in our intellectual universe. But let me now turn to the subject. Um, what is it that I have concluded in, in looking over as best I can? I mean, basically, I'm an Americanist. Yes, I know a decent amount of Western history, but I'm not a specialist in the history of the West. What have I, what have I concluded in reviewing what I think is important to, to know about the history as it has been uh, pursued in the West? Well, in the first place, without question, it seems to me, revisionist history has been with us since the beginning. It's simply wrong to think, as many today on the right, but no doubt someday also on the left will say, it's wrong to believe that revisionist history is somehow a product of the awful post-1960s decades. Uh, and here, as my witness, I invoke none other than the redoubtable classicist historian of classic times, Donald Kagan, emeritus of Yale. Um, I mean, he's a formidable scholar. Um, he has argued in his wonderful book on Thucydides that Thucydides is the first revisionist historian. Now, I'm happy to stand behind Don Kagan. I think I'd go back to Herodotus himself who took a couple of slaps at Homer. But those two men, Herodotus and Thucydides, who inaugurated historical inquiry as we have come to know it, they were both inquiring minds who took nothing for granted, who were skeptical about the evidence that was put before them. And in the case of Thucydides, who right off the bat differed with Herodotus as what to what were the correct the right, the meat, the fitting, the suitable subjects of historical inquiry. So right at the very origins of, of historical thought in the West, we have an argument between these, well, really it was an argument that Thucydides made of Herodotus' work. Herodotus didn't answer back as far as we know. Um, it's an argument that commenced then about how history is to be done. In the second place, Revisionist history has never cohabited with a particular ideology or religion or a party or a group, nor um, again, as the right so often argues and fears, does the left win all interpretive battles. Now here again, I think one has to point to Thucydides. I mean, for 2,300 years, 2,300 years, the kind of history that Thucydides did commanded the field to itself. It was men, military affairs, political affairs, institutions, and the relations between states. And struggle as people began to do from the 18th century on to break out of that semi-prison of historical inquiry, it, we really didn't make substantial progress and land ourselves where we are today until sometime in the 19th century. 
So the, the, the traditional, the conservative uh, approach to historical inquiry had the field to itself for 2,300 years. After Herodotus, who was the great sort of promiscuous, curious, omnivorous person that he was, wrote social and cultural and intellectual, as well as political and military history. Um, and look too at, at, at the kind of historiography that we've been dealing with um, since the fourth century, fourth century of the Christian era. It was Christian historiography inaugurated by Eusebius, the Bishop of Caesarea. Um, and um, look, look, I mean, certainly the Christian historiography has commanded the field until recently. Um, look what happened to the historiography of the French Revolution in Francois Furet <laughs> declared some years ago that um, the French Revolution is over. Well, that sounds to me like a rather middle of the road, if not a conservative position, not accepted universally, of course. Look at the victory that the opponents of the Enola Gay exhibit on the Mall and the Air and Space Museum in the mid 90s won. I mean, conservatives win these battles as well as people on the left or liberals. And so there's no particular stable, safe home for any kind of historical interpretation on the political spectrum. In the third place, there are many varieties of revisionist history. And I've tried to give these varieties some names. All of you might find different way to distinguish different kinds of revisionist history. You might even think that the exercise that I put myself through to do so is irrelevant. I don't, because to say that something is revisionist history is like saying that ice is cold or that milk is white. It doesn't say very much. And you really have to ask yourselves when speaking of different, fresh, challenging interpretation, where it fits on a spectrum of revisionist history, what kind of revisionist history it is. And so I have, I, I now see revisionist history as, as falling into a number of categories. There's, for example, what I would call transformational um, history, deeply consequential ways of seeing the past that alter really forever the way in which the past is understood. I'd point here to Eusebius's transformation of history from the pagan classic mode, this is in the West only, to the Christian mode of interpretation. I'd also put Marx's um, uh, 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 theories, uh, Marx and Engels theories in that same category with Eusebius, even though Marx and Engels wouldn't have didn't call themselves historians and are, 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 are thinkers of a different kind. Um, then there's philosophical revisionism. The kind of argument we have is that the correct way to do history. Should history be the traditional kind of Thucydides or can it be broader, um, freer? Um, can it encompass everything, emotions, the sound, pencils, bookcases, everything, which we have now. We have histories of everything. That wouldn't have been possible two centuries ago. And there are some people who think that we've gone much too far. Then there's what I call conceptual history or conceptual revisionist history. Um, distinct ways of conceptualizing the past in new ways. I take here as an example, women's history and, and, and theories of changes in the position of women in the United States and elsewhere that have greatly, hugely advance our understanding of not only women's history, but of the history of, of every Western uh, society uh, that we know anything of. Then there's also what I would call method-driven revisionism, the kind of revisionist history that arises from the availability of methods that weren't available to us in earlier days. I mean, DNA um, uh, sampling is, is, in my view, um, the, 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 the major example of this. For example, it was, it was because of DNA science that we were able 
to learn about, and, and really, I think, conclusively, the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. That, that revision of our view of, of Virginia, of Jefferson, of slavery in Monticello, and everything else couldn't have been secured without DNA science. Then there's evidence-driven revisionism, um, uh, new ways of looking at the past because of the discovery of new evidence. I mean, take, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, they, they altered um, our, our understanding of the Eastern Mediterranean um, in the days of the Jews and uh, the Palestinians and that, that entire part of the, 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 the crescent of, of, of the East. And then whatever's left over is normal revisionist history. And, and be easy on me with that because I don't want to, it's for what most of us do. Um, we refine what has been argued before. We adjust our views of this and that subject. We add to what has been known or thought about a subject. Sometimes normal revisionist history can be exceedingly influential and important. Um, then there's the matter of scale, which I think is very, very important um, when I return to the matter of a definition of revisionist history. Um, uh, I you have to keep in mind the, um, the nature of the subject that we're, that's being discussed. For example, no one is going to claim that a new way of looking at the Battle of Little, whatchamacallit, in Lower Slobovia is really revisionist, okay? Certainly not on the scale of Eusebius's Christian transformation of Western historiography. But if we keep scale and scholarly context in mind, in this case, a work about a battle that's scarcely going to royal any major dimension of historiography, in my view, it's revisionist within its scholarly context. And in that sense, it deserves to be called revisionist history, even though very few of us will read the article or the short book that takes up uh, that battle, um, whose name and place I've just made up. Um, so of course it's not Eusebian in scale, but it's revisionist history nonetheless within the ambit within the, with the context of its subject. Um, then I've asked myself, so with all this to do about revisionist history and, and if I take it as a phenomenon, what does it do for public and civic life? Does, does revisionist history have any use not only to historians, but to people, to citizens, to subjects. Um, I think it's better off to ask the question as to whether revisionist histories bear fruit. And here I think the answer is without question, uh, yes. Uh, the subject, and, and I here defer to, to Sarah, a historian of, of France, um, I, I take as my my, my poster subject, the histories of the French Revolution, which really have helped to define um, the way in which France is understood, not only as a nation state, but the French are understood as a people with potency, with political capacity. Um, and historians have played an extraordinary role in, in defining the French nation to the French themselves. So. Um, and, and I think the same kind of fruits were generated in the Enola Gay controversy here in the United States in the 1990s because it made clear to those people, most of us, I assume, who were following the debates that were being generated here in the National Air and Space Museum, because it clarified for people what was at stake as we tried to memorialize and understand and present the history of one of the defining events of the 20th century. And um, it made no difference to me as an analyst 
who won won that battle. It's it's rather that the debate itself was being educational, and that was one of the fruits of the debate as to how the past was to be presented, which side, so to speak, the military, the Air Force Association side, or the academic historians who had a different view of the past than the Air Force uh, veterans did. Also, I think we have to keep in mind that revisionist history does not take place within the confines of the academy. It never has, and it still doesn't. We do not, as professional historians, control the course of historical inquiry. Now, this may be a truism to most of us, but I think it still has to be uttered and kept in mind. Culture, society, the climate of opinion all play a strong role. Um, historians may not follow the election returns, but we exist in the culture into which we're born and we live our lives. Um, and we, we ought to do a better job of confronting the cynicism about what's taken to be our partialities. I mean, is there any human population that has no relationship to its culture, its thought, its social relations, its geographic location? Do we expect Chinese composers to write music in the manner of Thomas Addis or John Adams or um, Steve Reich? Um, we live comfortably, don't we all, with the poetry of both John Donne and E. e. Cummings? I mean, um, there's, there's a cornucopia of choices that we have. We're all different people different temperaments, different dispositions. We write different histories. And that's what makes historical knowledge so rich, I think, in, 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 in the minds of all of us who were together this afternoon. And I do think that we um, need to pay more attention in explaining to our students and to the general public that we do our best to be aware of the limits to our own thought. We do our best to keep in mind um, our, 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 our search for the final truth, the objective truth perhaps, although I doubt that, uh, about certain aspects of the past. Um, but we remain ourselves and we can only see the past out of our own temperaments and our own places in society and our own origins. And that gets us to the fact that unless historical thought is to be divorced from all from life, it has to make sense to the people in the era um, in which it's produced. So that means that historical interpretations eventually go out of date and no longer speak to later times in the way they did when they were developed, written, and produced. But it's the same thing with, say, popular music. I mean, the public doesn't find Cole Porter and Dick Rogers and George Gershwin and Steve Rice. Um, um, that it doesn't, it, its musical tastes are different because the music now appeals to the people who are alive today. And the same thing with our histories. And so the interpretations that historians produce have to speak to the people um, of the day in which the histories are written. And after all, the historians themselves are members of that population and are part of the world for which they write. So we are ineluctably part of the context in which our histories are written. And so our histories are going to reflect um, our times and our minds, and they're going to differ from the histories that were written earlier. And, and they, because of that, they enrich the entire body of historical knowledge that has come to exist. Um, I think of historical knowledge now as, as sedimentary. I mean, it's, it's there to be tossed up by, by new modes of thought, by um, new sets of views, the same way that that the strata are exposed by volcanoes and by earthquakes and, and so on. Um, they're there in the soil, ready to be used. They're always affecting 
the histories that we write. We are the children of our predecessors, which gets me finally to the vexing, but the necessary question of objectivity. Um, we can be empiricists without being held to the standard of God-like completion, all seeing, all knowing, all at once. Um, we move forward like, I don't know, snakes or crabs do from side to side, not in straight lines. We add to what was thought and what was written before us. Um, um, but we drive ourselves still, I think, and have to towards what Charles Beard called that noble dream of objectivity. Now, one of the reviewers for the press of my book um, urged that I drop the subject of objectivity uh, uh, from it. And I didn't take that advice because I thought a lot had been thought about the problem of objectivity since Peter Novick uh, wrote his wonderful book in the 1980s. Um, we've learned a lot about objectivity that couldn't have been thought of or hadn't been written about since then. Take, for example, um, David Lowenthal's book, The Past is a Foreign Country, in which Lowenthal makes this sharp distinction between history as it happened and history as it's recalled and left in the evidence. These two are, 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 are separated or are distinct um, in ways that can't be bridged. Um, then there's a new histories of scientific objectivity that go beyond Tom Kuhn's earlier work. And I, I refer here and urge all of you to become acquainted with the wonderful book called Objectivity by Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison. Um, they make the case that, and, I, and it's convincing uh, to me, that scientists are implicated in their science. It's science, there's no such thing as um, an impersonal science. That science grows out of human needs, human intentions. Um, and to think that even science's objectivity is incorrect. Um, and I think one has to, we have to as historians to defer a bit to the knowledge of such historians of science and see that science itself probably can't, at least as we understand it today, be objective in the old ways that we thought it could. And then of course, there's Hayden White's contents of the form, there's discourse course theory coming out of Europe, um, the death of the author and so on. And then since Peter Novick's book, there are the advances in neuroscience and in memory. And it, it makes it impossible for me to think that there can ever be an apodictic, certain, unchanging view of any part of the past, that every interpretation of the past is relative to every other one, and that you understand the past only by understanding all of the ways in which people so far have interpreted interpreted a certain part of the past. And so in that sense, I end up in a postmodern position, although I've never until now thought of myself as a postmodernist. But when I think about the subject of objectivity as told to me by others, um, I think we accept the ideal, that noble dream of trying to understand the past, V.S. Eigenlich gewesen war, but we never get there. And of course, Ronka's statement can be translated two ways. We in the Anglophone world have taken the translation to be as the past actually happened. Other translations would have it as the past essentially happened. Those are very different actually and essentially. And if we take it, if we take Ronka's statement in the second translation, in the, in, the, in the spirit of the second translation, we probably have it right. 
that we're driving ourselves always to get closer asymptotically to what really happened, but we'll never get there. But if we can get to an understanding of what essentially happened and we can narrow the differences and our arguments between each other, then we're making progress. So I end with the sense that Revisionist history is part of the richness of an open, free, democratic society. A, a society that prohibits its members from freely conceptualizing the past by the use of evidence and freely criticizing what others have written about the past is not a free society. It is North Korea, it is Russia, it is Hungary, it is Texas. And um, uh, we, should, we should celebrate revisionist history. We should explain to those who are fearful of it, who think there's something wrong with it. We should explain to them what we historians do and where we come out better than we've succeeded in doing. And that's one of the features that makes our intellectual life so robust and so creative, the freedom to create the histories then comport with what we think the evidence allows us to argue, and then the freedom to subject those histories to evaluation and sometimes to merciless attack. And to that possible fate, I now submit what I've just said and turn the microphone over to Sarah Masso. Thank you very much, Jim. You've managed to scratch the surface of a rich and fascinating book, and I hope we get to explore what you've said and the other issues in it uh, momentarily. Um, I am delighted to uh, note that our commentator today, uh, as Christian uh, said at the outset, is Sarah Maza, who is the Jane Long Professor in the Arts and Sciences and Professor of History at Northwestern University a specialist in French social and cultural history and in issues of historical theory and methods. Her books include Servants and Masters in 18th Century France, The Uses of Loyalty, published by Princeton University Press in 1983, Private Lives and Public Affairs, The Cause Celeb of Pre-Revolutionary France, University of California Press, 1993. This won the David Pinckney Prize of the Society for French Historical Studies, The Myth of the French Bourgeoisie, an essay on the social imaginary, 1750 to 1850, Harvard University Press, 2003, which won the AHA's George Moss Prize, and Violette Nozier, A Story of Murder in 1930s Paris, University of California Press, 2011, and Thinking About History, University of Chicago Press in 2017. Sarah, we're delighted that you could join us. The Zoom room is all yours. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm really honored to be asked to comment on uh, Jim Banner's rich and stimulating book, The Ever-Changing Past. And I'm also looking forward to uh, the discussion, as it's a book that, given its subject, invites debate. I should perhaps that my comments, uh, which may sound a little punchy, uh, won't come as a surprise to Jim because we've been having this conversation since I first read the book in draft and I'm delighted to extend uh, the conversation to a larger group. So uh, the ever-changing past is a wide-ranging, eminently readable, uh, one of the best introductions I know to what uh, makes historians tick and I encourage anyone with a broad interest in history to read it. Uh, to cut to the chase, since I don't want to take up too much time, the way that the book is set up does involve to my mind a, a bit of slate of hand. On the one hand, as Jim points out in the introduction, it really is the first book since 1929 to explicitly take on as its central theme, the question of historical revisionism. On the other hand, and here's where it becomes controversial, Jim is committed to a very broad definition of historical revisionism, which, uh, and, and he's mentioned this, the capaciousness of his definition, which he gives in the introduction, uh, and I'm quoting him, I define historical revisionism not simply as alterations in historical interpretations, but more specifically as any challenge to historical interpretations 
brought about by new evidence, new arguments, new perspectives, or new methods. So the only sort of uh, history that's not revisionist, he posits, is, quote, mere additions to historical knowledge. Now, the commonly accepted definition of revisionism in the historical profession, and I think probably beyond, is the process whereby a dominant interpretation that's accepted quasi-universally is challenged and replaced by a radically different interpretation, which often flips the orthodoxy uh, inside out. It's often analogized to the Copernican revolution and to you know, the shift from an earth-centered to a heliocentric view of the universe. You, you, you're looking at something and in changing it radically to almost its opposite. As the book points out, the paradigmatic example is the history of the French Revolution. I'm not just saying this because I'm a French historian, but it's also absolutely the clearest case in the historiography. Until around 1965, everyone, including people who were hostile to Marxism, assumed that the essence of the French Revolution was self-evidently the rise of the bourgeoisie and its toppling of the aristocracy and the monarchy, which was an outgrowth of aristocracy. And then as a result of a massive and successful revisionist challenge by the 1980s, nearly all scholars in the field accepted the view that the revolution was, as one scholar memorably put it, quote, not a social revolution with political consequences, but a political revolution with social consequences. There's been similar radical reframing in other fields, such as the history of the Cold War, where the initial paradigm of Soviet aggression was flipped to a paradigm of US aggression. You could say that the Enola Gay affair reflected another kind of revisionist view from the decision to drop the bomb was regrettable, uh, but necessary to uh, the dropping of the bomb was aggressive and strategic, the first act in the Cold War and aimed at the Soviets and so on. So there are a few, it, there are quite a few, um, some clearer than others, models of this flipping inside out, which is what historians usually think of when we say uh, revisionism. Um, so these uh, revisions that I've mentioned happened rather quickly. Others have been more extended in time, but still are radically revisionist. I would say that arguably over the last few decades and increasingly in the last few years, US history as a whole is being turned inside out as black and native American histories have gone from marginal subjects to centrally defining ones. So I think it's true that there hasn't been a study of revisionism in this classic and distinct sense in a very long time. But then if you include in the definition as Jim does, changes brought about, and I'm quoting him, by new evidence, new arguments, new perspectives, or new methods, then all of the numerous introduction to historical methods books out there, including my own, do some version of that. So I'd say that the ever-changing past is both innovative and debatable in its collapsing together on the, one of, on the one hand, a very distinctive process, the systematic challenge to a historical orthodoxy, and on the other, a broader and more familiar theme, which is methodological innovation in history. Um, there's one aspect of the question that Jim doesn't neglect, but I think should be in my view more central and possibly the defining, a defining argument in a book such as this one, which is the sociology of the profession. Arguably and paradoxically, some of the most radical revisionism in the past century came out of ultra traditional academic politics. Three or four decades ago, when the profession was almost entirely male, 
revisionist work was typically driven by a sort of testosterone fueled zero sum game. You made your career by attacking the biggest guy in your field that you dared to take on and being right involved proving that someone else was wrong. There should be a book or probably at least a very good article about the field of 17th century British history, <laughs> which in the 20th century was a continual bloody slugfest between various Oxbridge dons and their American allies, scholars with initials instead of first names, attacking each other over mystifyingly obscure issues connected to the English Civil War. Uh, my point is that some of the most dramatic revisionism was for ages an insider's game. Revisionism in Jim's broader sense of methodological change came about when with working class, then female, gay and minority historians entering the profession. Feminist historians started out saying in essence, we're not going to pay attention to your boys games. We're looking at different subjects and different sources and they tended to be more ironic, weavers rather than hunters. Natalie Davis, who is widely considered the founding mother of feminist history in this country, made a career out of never attacking anyone. I'm not saying that Jim Banner doesn't mention the changing sociology of the profession, he does, but just that to me, this would be the defining theme of a book like this. Identity politics uh, continued to roil the profession. In his final chapter about objectivity, Jim Banner's stance is rather upbeat. He writes that while we pretty much accept that the one-time ideal of objectivity is unattainable, uh, and I certainly agree with that, with his diagnosis there, historians, quote, still hold to the conviction that they can and do make progress in closing the gap between historical ignorance and historical understanding. They still try to arrive at a reasonably impartial knowledge of what happened and why it did to the best of their knowledge. I actually came to a similar conclusion in my own book. Uh, we know we have a partial view. We know we'll never be objective but we try to do the best within the rules of the game that we all accept. And that's the kind of practical position taken in response to postmodernism by Lynn Hunt et al in telling the truth about history. And um, I thought that was a reasonable view uh, three or four years ago, uh, but I'd certainly inflect it now. There's a powerful questioning of the very rules of the game that's been mounted in recent, very recent years by scholars of color, including luminaries like Michel Wolf Trouillot, Sadia Hartman, and Marisa Fuentes, and others, who point out that the very archives that we rely on are tainted since they suppress and silence the histories of groups like the enslaved who have had no legal or social existence. How, these scholars are asking, can you possibly continue to play by the rules of the game when those rules, that is the archives that historians worship, by design omit certain people? So while we know objectivity is impossible, but we do our best is a good message for the general public, I think it may have become a trickier position within the profession. We're now facing a kind of radical challenge that is a return, could be a return to some of the more fraught debates um, in the era of postmodernism. I, I want to end with a couple of challenges and questions uh, to Jim or to indeed to anyone else who cares to take them up, uh, going from the most to the least specific. First, still on the specific question of sources, I'm at odds with Jim with respect to his statement on page 162 that, quote, evidence-based revisionism, the discovery of major new historical sources is the holy grail for most historians. Yes, it does make a big difference when formerly closed archives are opened up for research and in fields that are extremely poor in sources, uh, something like the Dead Sea Scrolls makes a huge difference. But beyond that, for most historians, I don't actually believe that history changes when we find a new source. 
It's the opposite. We find new sources when we ask new questions. The DNA evidence that Jim mentioned proving Jefferson's paternity of Sally Hemings' children is powerfully conclusive, but historians only went after the DNA evidence because Jefferson's relationship to Hemings went from a salacious gossipy item to uh, a foundationally symbolic story about race and gender and the nation's founding. So on this particular point, I would beg to differ. The other question or challenge I have returns to the capaciousness of the book's definition of revisionism, which includes rewritings of uh, major histories, methodological change, and even as Banner writes, additive history, the lowest common denominator of revisionist history. Given all this, given how broad the definition is, my question would simply be, can you offer examples of notable works of history that are not revisionist? What, what would a non-revisionist history look like? And finally, my final question is very brief and basic. I was curious about the accepted definition of revisionism, and of course, I went to the old internet to check it out. Outside of the original formulation connected to Marxism, all of the examples I found were historical. My question is, do other disciplines engage in revisionism? And if not, why is it only history that does? So with that, I'll get out of the way so that the conversation can begin. Thank you so much, Sarah. I suspect that we could take up the rest of the evening um, just scratching the surface of the questions that you've posed. And we have a large number of people uh, in the queue uh, eager to ask questions. So Jim, if you could just take a moment or two to respond to some of what uh, Sarah uh, says, uh, and then we can uh, open it up. Um, I will, and I, I will be brief. I, and I, Sarah, you and I will continue this um, later, I hope, because the questions are very rich and they get me thinking anew right. and, and, and probably better than I did. Silences, I, I don't know how you write history if you don't have evidence. In other words, we're, we're trying now to theorize that. And um, I've read some of those works and they're really quite extraordinary. In fact, I've just finished something that's speculative because this, the evidence doesn't exist. And I've been crucified in the peer reviews. I mean, it's very hard to, to deal with, with, with the past if you don't have any evidence for the part of it that you're interested in. Um, and so I take um, that uh, criticism and your comments there very, very seriously. Other disciplines, yes, I mean, there, there, there are certainly uh, revisionist histories of art and music. Those are the ones that I know the best and, and, and they're, new, they're different schools of sociology and so on. So um, I think the answer to that has to be yes. What would a non-revisionist history look like? It wouldn't be history would be annals or chronicle. We had those. We had them well into the early modern period. We don't write them anymore because they're really lists of facts. They're boring. They tell us nothing. There's, they're devoid of interpretation. They're devoid of, devoid of causality. In fact, they look a lot like eighth grade American history, fact after fact after fact. That's what they look like. Um, and we we try to put an end to those. And, we don't succeed, but that should be part of our remit. Um, let me stop there um, and to, to thank you hugely for your comments. And I've made a note of as many as I could keep up with. And Eric, I turn it back to you. Thank you. So we're now going to open this up uh, in a moment. Uh, you can use the raise hand function uh, and that way you get to pose your question directly. Uh, you can use the Q&A function in which I get to pose your question. And similarly, there's an email address, ebillings at gwu.edu, uh, especially for those on Facebook Live who are watching uh, that you can write your questions uh, in that way. Let me just take co-chair's prerogative to throw one out to get us started, Jim. Um, and on the sort of issue of scale, um, I'm going to imagine that most historians do not view themselves nor would necessarily embrace uh, the task of transformative revisionism, uh, right? You know, that's the biggie. Uh, and, and most of us normal human historians don't get that far uh, in what we do. Um, all water is wet, uh, ice is cold, all history is revisionism. Um, I'm wondering if 
there is a different phenomenon that you might reflect on. Historians as kind of pack animals um, or herd historians or um, uh, like a flock of historians or lemming historians. That is to say, uh, rather than transform knowledge as we know it, um, maybe within the realm of the additive category that you have, quite often, we don't break new conceptual ground, we reinforce old conceptual ground, uh, and that we take comfort um, or uh, find ourselves you know, behind the protective barrier of what other people have done. Uh, and would you just reflect a bit um, about you know, how, how historians go about doing their work? Um, are we too cautious? Uh, do we follow you know, the Pied Piper historian leader um, uh, and don't uh, attempt to be more revisionist um, than, than perhaps we could? Eric, those are good questions. And I, 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 I don't think, I don't feel myself capable of answering them um, be, because I, I think some people go into their work and their researches and their arguments with a determination to prove something wrong or to, as you would say, I think, to prove something right, to confirm what's already been known. Some of us write history and we, as I also insist on, once it's out, we have no control over the use to which it will be put. Um, and so we don't know the fate of what we write, who will use it for what purposes. Some, some very fine histories have been used for the most nefarious purposes and miscast and misinterpreted uh, for, for those reasons. Um, I, it seems to me that confirming history can be revisionist in that it adds to ways to strengthen previous arguments or it invokes additional evidence to strengthen an existing way of looking at things or it takes an approach to one subject and applies it to another which hasn't felt the impact of that approach that was used in another on another subject in that subject. Um, so I mean what I'm really urging is that we be more generous <laughs> in, in, in accepting what we do and what our colleagues try to do, even when we disagree with them. I mean, that's why, as, as, as a collectivity, as a community of thinkers who causer themselves to evidence that exists, as, as Sarah would insist on, we move forward in argument. We move forward in collective endeavor. Um, but both of you have raised issues of the sociology of historical work. And, and, and I've taught this subject now twice. And I will tell you, Sarah's absolutely right. My students are as interested in learning about why historians argue with each other and where their arguments have come from and how the academization of history has affected what we think about and how we go about our work and the how the introduction of new populations into our midst have transformed historiography in the last 50, 60 years. They're fascinated by that. There's a story here to tell. Historians have not told it. Sociologists haven't told it. It needs to be told. Thank you. Robert Harris has his hand up. If you would, there you go. If you would introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Good to see you. And uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you how much you were influenced by your book, which uh, I was honored to have an essay in it on African-American history, a century of American historiography. It seems to me that many of the issues that you're addressing here uh, were basically raised in that book because uh, I think most of those essays are revisionists. Well, um, Bob, it's nice to, to, I don't see you, but it's nice to have you on. Um, uh, the, those essays covered the historiography of their respective fields, African-American history, Native American history, the history of politics, the history of 
international affairs and so on, um, I was strengthened as I think, I mean, I think all of us who are professional and certainly academic historians are, are very well versed in the literature of our special subjects, our specialty subjects. And um, if we're not, we're not good historians. But as I said earlier, I'm trying to stand back and look at that from a kind of um, epiphenomenal position. I'm standing above all of those essays that you and I were involved in bringing to publication. I'm standing above them and asking, okay, so what does all of this mean as a general phenomenon? And that's the contribution that I've been trying to make. And, um, and to that degree, becoming acquainted with the literature and other fields uh, it did make a difference to me and helped propel me uh, toward writing this book. Samantha Riggin has a hand up, if you would, very good, and introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, hello, Mr. Banner, Samantha Riggin from uh, uh, Virginia Tech. How do you know, or, or is there a way to know or quantify when there is enough evidence to deem, uh, to deem worthy of revisionist history. I'm not quite sure how else to ask it. How do you know when uh, somebody has enough uh, proof uh, to, to qualify uh, to, to, bring up that, to bring up that topic and to challenge that topic? Is there a way, is there a way to quantify that? Um, uh, Ms. Riggin, I don't think so. Um... <laughs> in a matter like this, I, I invoke the Lewis Powell test, namely, you know it when you see it, but then you argue about it. And um, you and I might differ, and both of us might be right, and both of us might be wrong as to whether something is revisionist or whether the evidence that is invoked to make an argument is, is, is satisfactory, is adequate to make that argument. But it's the, it's the process of debating and arguing and changing our views and learning from others. That is a hallmark of historical inquiry and really has been for, for two and a half millennia. That's one of the points I'm trying to make. And so it's impossible to cleanse our work um, of, of argument, of disagreement, of controversy, sometimes of bitter battle. Um, and the only pro way we can make progress is, is arguing with each other, trying to close the gaps, trying to, through being people of goodwill, to learn from each other. Um, and, you and, and there's no way of getting unanimity on, um, on, on evidence and its use. It's all a matter of critical evaluation, I think. Thank you. David Sobelson has a hand up. If you would unmute and introduce. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Sobelson. I'm a constitutional law scholar who feels compelled to correct your misattribution of that quote to Lewis Powell. It's actually Potter Stewart who said he knew. I'm sorry. You're English, right. You're, but, you're you're absolutely right. I'm um, sorry. Yep. That's not that's not what I wanted to say. I uh, read an absurdist play once that had the line: "Anyone can predict the future." But who can predict the past? History is collective memory. And haven't neurobiologists shown that all memory is revisionist memory? And more important, is there any way to predict future revisionist history? Um, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good, good question. I'm going to take a pass on that second question, Mr. Sobelson, because, um, uh, uh, simply because we're not predictors. We, we're people who work with what we, what we know and not what we can dream. Um, and that's, that's our uh, deformation professionnelle, I suppose, and a negative one. Um, also, I think it's terribly cynical. I, I, I want to make the distinction between skepticism and cynicism. Those who would dismiss history and all historians work because they're only working from their own prejudices and their own origins and, and, and their own situations and so on, um, is a cynical approach. We, we are very good through criticism and evaluation and self-knowledge and 
being trained the way we are, that we're, we're reasonably good at any rate of, of expunging our work of the most egregious uh, prejudices and biases. But um, we, we, we can never escape them. And the neuroscientists, which you wisely cite, don't believe that all memory is defective. It's partial, but so is evidence. Every mind is partial because it differs from every other mind. And it seems to me it, our job as historians is to try to determine what is valid evidence and valid argument. And when we don't have evidence, we're in trouble. And that's the point to which Sarah was alluding earlier. People are trying now to figure out what sense can be made of silence, uh, the absences, lacuna uh, in the evidence. In the same way, we have to begin to figure out, we have to pay more attention, constant attention to neuroscience and to figure out how we use and how we evaluate and how we're cautious about memory mistakes. Not all memory is defective. It really is not. And the neuroscientists will tell you that. Well, some of it is, but, you, but our mind's correct for some of those defects too. And certainly criticism and discussion like this does the same. Thank you. Richard Willing has a hand up. Please unmute and introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hi, Jim. Um, and Hello, Meyer, Rick. for all too brief a time, a uh, uh, student of uh, Professor Banner, Dick Willing here. Uh, Jim, in the uh, introduction to the book, congratulations, by the way, um, bringing forth another child, <laughs> amazing. Uh, in the introduction, you talk about uh, interpretive zeal uh, not being a quality that's exclusively the property of the left. Uh, and uh, you note uh, that interpretive zeal has been expressed in the left and on the right profession. Your examples in the left, uh, Howard Zinn's People's History, and I think James Lowen's uh, Why Is Your Teacher Told You. Um, and on the right, your examples are not published works at all. They are the actions of uh, autocrats in Poland and Hungary, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, in their attempts to scrub, if you will, to have historians or quasi-historians do their work and scrub references to collaboration with Germans during the war and to um, uncharitable references to the former Soviet Union, et cetera. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm feeling a, a, like a little bit of a sucker punch here from you. Are we to infer from the evidence you present that uh, uh, there are no countervailing professional historians on the right who are reinterpreters in the same way Zinn and Lowen are? Well, Dick, that's a very good question. And now that you point out the imbalance in my choices, um, I regret that I left it that way. Um, but <laughs> frankly, no, no one on the right, the, the right has been the target of, I mean, conservative history, let's put it that way. It's not the right, it's just conservative historiography has been the target since the 1960s of people like, um, uh, like Howard Zinn and Jim Wallen, and they've done a wonderful job at awakening us to the problems with that conservative historiography. Um, so it's the right that has been the punching bag. And so the excess, it seems to me, had to come from historical writings and attacks from the left. Um, I just happen to see that the dangers now on, on the right are more uh, socio-political. Um, they're more state-centered, um, they're more authoritarian. I mean, certainly no one is going to claim that Howard Zinn or Jim Lowen have authoritarian <laughs> tendencies. Um, the, the danger on the right now is really authoritarian um, statism and authoritarian thugism. That's where the danger is. But I'm, I'm thank you for alerting me to that imbalance of presentation. If I can do anything about it, um, I will. If I can, if I can jump in, since Eric yes. invited me to, um, I would say that that's a really interesting point. Um, that that asymmetry, 
And uh, there are um, books that are published on the, the there are right wing books. Um, Bill O'Reilly, for instance, is sure, one of course. The, the best selling historical writers today, alas. And um, and there there there's a whole industry of books about you know why Howard Zinn is wrong. Um, so that literature does exist, but typically I think it's interesting that the um, uh, the idea the the left has been uh, on the left more ideologically more explicitly in its purpose. Whereas what we think of as conservative historians are historians who are on the right methodologically. Uh, that is uh, historians who uh, claim that only say diplomatic or military history uh, matter. And it's a, it's a rapidly changing um, uh, target because some people, uh, there are historians who are doing you know, mainstream history who find themselves taken over on the left since the dynamic in, in the profession is on the left. So, you know, today's mainstream history is tomorrow's conservative history um, in terms of, of, you know, the, you know, once you get beyond the ideologically marked types like Bill O'Reilly. So it's an interesting question and it's an interesting distinction there, I think. Someone I saw a brief note and I couldn't read it carefully in the chat function. The name Gertrude Himmelfarb, um, uh, the late B. Himmelfarb, um, was really um, was, was practicing defensive history. She was offering a defense of the traditional subjects and the, the traditional ways in which historical knowledge and the advance of historical knowledge was pursued. I never considered her. I, I, I don't, she wasn't a radical ideologue of the right. She was a traditionalist and um, that's different than what we see coming out of authoritarian states. Thank you. We have a question in the Q and A from Joan Hoff, who's read a previous work of yours, Jim. Uh, uh, in a recent book, uh, Banner edited on presidential misconduct, uh, you specifically said that in the introduction, um, you told authors of the essays uh, that they should deliberately lack interpretation and not base their essays on any new research other than the time <laughs> when the presidency ended. How does this comport with your definition of revisionism? Well, Joan, that's a, a fair question. I laughed because I didn't like those restrictions either, but they were imposed on us, as I think I explained to you at one point, by the 1974 report um, that uh, we, I was among them, a group of historians, um, submitted to John Doerr and the impeachment inquiry. We were, we were told to write denatured history, facts only facts. And if you read those essays, which I'm certain uh, you have, Joan, and others have also, um, they are the nature boring. They're partial because you don't you, you, you don't characterize any presidential administration just by the misconduct of some of its members. I mean, after all, look at look at Harry Truman's administration, for example. You know, there was a lot of unfortunate stuff going on, but Harry Truman had some pretty serious decisions to make and did a decent job of them. And you you size up his administration differently. So that was very partial, very narrow historiography, unpleasant to read, but it laid down the record. And, but I didn't, I wouldn't start a book that way now, Joan, but in the revision of the 1974 report in which you and I both involved ourselves, we stuck with the original mandate. So to maintain consistency, it's not good history. It's a good report. All right, Claudine Schweber has her hand up. Uh, please unmute and introduce yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, as he said, I'm Claudine Schweber. I'm professor adjunct at GW and professor emeritus at the University of Maryland Global Campus. I have a point that is slightly off left or right history. I have seen it part of my life is to share some historical, uh, some tr talents and ways of thinking of historians in other disciplines to cross pollinate. And one of the great gifts, it seems to me, 
of historians is now quite needed, which is to challenge, quote, claims of fake news. What do historians do? We look at the literature, we look at what people say is their evidence, and then we look and critique the evidence. Where did it come from? What was the documentation? Was there any, what influenced that perspective? Was there a particular grant that so-and-so had? And that's part of quote revisionist history, but it seems to me that historians have a, 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 an option or a possibility of sharing this gift of this critical analysis and asking questions about the evidence that supports something. And I make my students, I teach in, um, I, I've taught in management programs and then now I teach in um, organizational science and some other, I put the historical framework as one of the requirements. If they are writing about something, I want to know something about the sources. What discipline? When did the person write? What other perspectives were there or why? Is there a Rashomon effect, et cetera? We need people, I, it seems to me the historical discipline has this fantastic talent that we need to spread outside of just history. Well, um, Professor Trevor, I, you're absolutely right. Um, I think, um, and, and we all should borrow and learn more from other disciplines and the practitioners thereof. I think, I, I don't want, I, I don't quite know how to interpret what you've said, but if you are pessimistic, you and I disagree, because I think that after a long time, a long era of somnolence, historians are doing a much better job at applying their knowledge to public affairs and doing so publicly. Op-eds, essays, debates on television. We have opportunities now, which we didn't have before. After all, we, until what, 30 years ago, we didn't have C-SPAN. There was no, there were no history channels and so on. So I, I do think we have more opportunities to make the contribution that you and I agree ought to be made. And I think also that we're doing a better job of it. I salute those historians who do so. Um, and I think we should all take hope um, from what they do. Thank you. Um, Adnan Morshed is, uh, has got a hand up. Uh, if you would unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm a professor of architectural history at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. I have a simple question. Uh, can revisionist history ever be apolitical? If you are questioning the canon, if you are questioning the hegemonic knowledge, if you are questioning the uh, disciplinary matrix of history, uh, you are inviting political backlash from within the discipline or beyond. And I'm reminded of uh, Bernard Lewis's angry reaction to uh, Edward Said's publication of Orientalism. Can you, can you ever be apolitical in your knowledge production in producing revisionist history without instrumentalizing knowledge? Um, Professor Morshed, that's a, that's a very good question. I'm going to answer it with a, with a, a tiny bit, a brief autobiographical um, instance. My first book was on the Federalists of Massachusetts. They were the conservatives of their day. I'm a man of the left, maybe not the far left, but I'm a man of the left. I wanted to rescue the Federalists from their bad press because I thought that you could not understand <laughs> the history of the early American nation, unless you brought them into the picture and you brought them into, a pic into the picture in ways that were recognizable to those of us who were doing scholarship in that field in the 1960s. Now, I guess some people think of me as a conservative historian. I'm not a conservative historian. I was trying to rescue a group of people who after all had their own life, their own integrity, their own intentions, their own purposes, saw life in a particular way. And I wanted to get them back into the picture. And if Linda Kerber is on um, this, this, uh, at this seminar, which I, I believe she is, she will understand what I'm saying. She did the same thing. 
we're not people of the right. So yes, I think you can write revisionist history. You can take issue with others. You can fill gaps. Um, you can do so without taking a political stand. You do it for the benefit of increasing and improving and enriching the knowledge of the subject that you're pursuing. And then your critics may pigeonhole you, may identify you, but you've written the history you have for the purpose you have, and that itself has integrity. Thank you. Phil Katz has a hand up. Please unmute and introduce yourself. Hi, it's great to, uh, to hear from Jim and to see him in action. You know, there's lots of interesting things here. First, a quick comment about the, um, the conservative revisionists. I think one thing that you see is not um, a conservative response on the same playing field as the historians, but a switch to a different playing field. And I mentioned those moments when revisionism takes the form of, the, for example, a certain reaction to um, social history in the 60s was for certain conservatives to really double down on economics as the right way to interpret um, social activity. And that in its own way was a revision by switching the playing field. But that's a side point to my, my main thing that interests me here is the difference between or the dividing line between interpretation and epistemology. Uh, because some of the really interesting issues here are not when people are trying to tinker with interpretation, but really uh, battles between very different understandings of meaningful um, historical questions and, and attentions. And when it comes to that kind of battle, I wonder if revisionist history is any different from the battles that go on in other fields. Is revisionist history a, a subset of other revisions? I mean, there are lots of battles around science, theology, economics, name your field of thought that really are battles about an established and emerging epistemologies. So I wonder if revisionist history is just a subset of that much bigger um, sort of human conflict. Um, as always, Phil, a, a, a very important question. Um, um, there's not time uh, left to us to go into that. I think that, uh, I don't think that, uh, in some ways, uh, what we're talking about is a subset um, in our discipline of what goes on elsewhere. Um, what I'm trying to do, though, is to bring to attention of historians the history in which we are ineluctably involved by because of the history of our discipline, of historical thought, of our methods, of kind of evidence we use, and so on. Um, I'm certain there's more to be learned from the kind of arguments that take place in other disciplines. Um, I'm not able to, to deal with that question. Um, maybe I think you and I should pursue this matter at some other time, but um, it, it's, it's a, it, that's a significantly um, essential question, I think. Um, if I could, I, if I could, yeah, go ahead. maybe maybe add a comment. I, I mean, I was that was uh, a little bit the the point of my question about does revisionist revisionism exist in other fields? It's interesting that the term is so rarely applied to other fields, um, but mm -hmm. they do, of course, have as you were saying, as the questioner was saying, you know, these these epistemological shifts. Um, I think that history is distinctive in that it is the only um, discipline that produces narratives that govern public life. There's nothing quite comparable to it in its public dimension. And that might maybe why, you know, this term has been singled out and applied to history as opposed to anything else because yeah. of that public facing aspect of, of the discipline. Yeah. I, let, let, let me just say that's absolutely right. And, and I think that makes historians more exposed to attack and their histories more exposed to attack um, than people in other disciplines, which makes it all the more important that we understand the phenomenon, talk about it among ourselves, talk about it with our students, try to bring it to the fore. And to that, I would add that we should be, do a better job of understanding what the nature of historical thought is here 
the, my case in point is counterfactual conditionals. I mean, the logicians, the philosophers have convinced me that it's, it's inherent in all historical thought, and yet we historians still make fun of it, think it's illegitimate, argue against it, um, when we're probably using it ourselves all the time without understanding why it's inherent in what we do. Um, and there must be other aspects of historical thought, of historical epistemology that we don't understand and we don't teach our students. And I think that's a loss for us all. I unfortunately have to draw this to a close. Uh, and I'm very sorry to do that. We have many people who have questions unanswered um, or unposed and unanswered. Uh, so my apologies to everyone still in that queue. Um, I want to thank so much uh, Jim Banner and Sarah Maza for this terrific discussion. Can I just ask Jim, is, is this a special day in any way? Uh, well, it, it's Monday after Sunday. Is this your birthday? Um, it happens to be. Thank yes. you. One of one of the people uh, uh, wrote to us in the chat. Uh, <laughs> this may be the first time that we've done a birthday uh, event, so we wish you uh, the absolute best. Uh, I want to thank everybody. <laughs> thank you. And I will turn this over to Christian Osterman to wrap this up. Thanks, Eric, and uh, happy birthday, uh, Jim. Uh, what a thank terrific, you, terrific session this was. Um, again, next week, Monday, May 10th at 4 p.m., we will discuss Alex Wellerstein's new book, Restricted Data, the History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States. Thanks again to Jim, Sarah, Eric for a wonderful discussion. Thanks to our audience for watching, for participating. We're adjourned. Stay safe and good night.